Hello there, Codemaker for you. As you can see in logic, memory is quite important. I mean, just in this room there is one, two, three, four different types of memory. So in this video, I'm going to be discussing all of the types of resettable and rewritable memory in Scrap Mechanic. First of all, I'm not going to be doing any sort of read-only memory. This includes memory that involves destroying cardboard with a spot gun. Why? Well, you might be thinking that you could use a vacuum pump with a chest full of cardboard to restock that, but that cardboard is going to run out eventually, so you can't infinitely reset it. I'm going to briefly mention uh, spot gun memory with a switch, uh, mainly because it's used in my SMC1. As you can see over here, this is the memory of the SMC1. What's nice about Spotcon and Switch memory is that uh, you can just edit the memory over here. You can see the entire memory all at once, which is very useful for beginners if you want to debug your memory. Um, but of course, you have to go through the physics engine. And the physics engine is the second reason that I'm not going to be mentioning any memory that involves spot guns. It's too unreliable and it's too slow for how much space and gates it takes up. So the first memory most of you have probably come against is this Nord Nord memory. It works by connecting two Nord gates together. You actually need this third gate because you need at least three logic gates to be able to create a loop. Ideally you would just connect this Nord gate right back to the first Nord gate but if you do that it just deletes the connection, which is not very useful. Instead, you create this third gate so that you can create a proper loop. This is usually the type of memory that beginners are introduced with, because it's very easy to get working. You need a very minimum amount of logic for the minimum functionality. It's, I mean, it's literally just the gate. You can hook up an on button and an off button, and a person can just press it and it works. And also, does hold up quite well for more complicated circuits. If you want to create a D-latch, which is a type of memory where you just give a switch of what the gate should be and a button that makes the memory into that state whenever you press it, you only need a little bit of extra circuitry. So this is very good for beginners to learn about memory and logic in Scrap Mechanic. Disadvantage is that if you give it a one tick pulse, it starts spazzing out. Same thing happens when you load it with a lift. So although it does look quite compact at first, if you want to actually use this into a logic intensive creation, you'll need to add a lot of helper logic to prevent one tick pulses and to unspam it. So it's good for beginners, but for more advanced circuitry, you don't want to use this. There are also different ways you can hook up three different types of gates together into a loop to create other types of memory, but I'm not gonna mention all of them, I'm just gonna generalize it into this category. Next up is my favorite type of memory by far, XOR memory. It's like a T flip-flop. So if you use this one tick pulse generator here and connect it to this loop of three connected XOR gates. So whenever I press this button, the state of the memory switches. So hence named the flip-flop because it flips around all of the time. It's actually quite easy to convert this into a DLH. This extra gate can basically detect whether or not the memory state right now and the goal input state are the same. And if they aren't, it's, go it's gonna turn it on. And when we give that input into an AND gate together with a button, we can make it go into the correct state. I should also mention that you can make this very compact by creating a self-wired extra gate. It's a single extra gate that has a wire connected that goes back to itself. You can't really do this in the vanilla game, but there are mods that allow you to do that. And the main advantage is that it's only one gate with the exact same functionality of all of these three. So you create one gate and you give it a one tick pulse, and every time you do that, it flips. Next up, there is a type of memory that was invented by CASP74. This is called 2 gates per bit RAM. Let me quickly explain what that means. So here's a random blueprint of a large amount of gate memory 
this is a type of memory that you usually want to use in a computer if you want to get relatively fast read-write access and don't want to store too much data. Because as you can see, this block that only stores 16 bytes of memory is humongous. It would be nice if we could categorize different types of logic gate memory into the, how much gate you need to store a single bit. So we come up with the measurement of gates per bit. It's literally that. How many gates do you need to store one bit of data? In this case, uh, the bytes are like this, and then the different addresses go like that. So one bit is these five gates. So this is one, two, three, four, five gates per bit. Should be noted here that the type of memory used here, just like the nor-nor memory, it is slightly different, but it uses only like three gates for the actual data storage. These gates here, which will typically be AND gates, depending on what type of memory you're using, um, they are still needed and count to the five gates per bit count. Why? Well, because you need one of these gates for each bit. It's like that, it's just as simple as that. These gates here, they don't count because they, because imagine if you would expand this memory infinitely in that direction, you wouldn't need to increase the amount of gates over here because these, because the logic from here is reused for all of these bits going to infinity. Same for the OR gates over here. If you would expand it into that direction until infinity, you, would, you could still get around with just these eight OR gates. So they don't count to the five gates per bit count. Now, as you can imagine, less gates per bit means a smaller memory usually speaking. And this is especially important for larger memory banks where the gates per bit count really influences how large the entire creation is, including this extra logic. So minimizing gates per bit is important. Usually we manage to do about three gates per bit because nowadays these three gates here can be one self-wired extra gate, but Caspi found a way to do it with two gates per bit. And that's what I'm demonstrating inside. So this here is two gates per bit memory. But wait a second, there's four gates here. Well, the trick is that we are using four gates to store two bits of data, and they're kind of intertwined. Now don't mind the green connections here. I'm using a special type of uh, memory gate from a logic mod. I'm using this uh, modded logic because it allows me to pause it using this button and give it a single logic step. Um, the timings here are quite important, so that's why I'm demonstrating it using modded logic. These gates behave exactly the same as in vanilla, except that I can slow them down. So these XOR gates here are self-wired XOR gates. They wire into each other. And these AND gates here are simultaneously input and output management for these two bits. This AND gate here is the output for that logic bit, and it's the input for that logic bit. So it's an output and input at the same time. Usually you'd have two separate AND gates for one for input and one for output, but here we've combined them into one single gate. How? Well, with a bit of trickery. Say we want to turn on this bit here. That means we need to give a one tick pulse into that XOR loop. Now we can't use this, gate he this switch here because they are connected to every single of the XOR bits. So instead we want to give this AND gate a one tick pulse. But we can't exactly do that right now um, because this AND gate is getting a turned off input from that extra gate. Because remember, it needs to also be able to function as an output. How do we solve this? We give a two tick pulse to every single extra gate in the memory. So this switch here would only need to exist once for an entire memory bank. And if you let two ticks pass, you can see that everything turned on and turned off or turned off and turned on. Because these extra gates, they flip every single tick that they receive a turned on input. So because of that, this AND gate is guaranteed to, in one of those two ticks, have had this gate on no matter what the initial state of it was. So if you tick one, so if you go one tick further, this extra gate received a one tick pulse from the AND gate and it was successfully flipped and it stays like that. Um, we can do another demonstration. So if you want to turn this extra gate on, 
it doesn't it you can do this no matter what the state over there is so we can just turn on this thing because we want to flip that and we turn that on wait for two ticks turn everything off again wait some more and now this thing is also turned on so this works no matter what the state of the other gate is so we don't have to worry about the state of the other gate so say we want to read what is in this bit reading does a switch from side to side so if we want to read this bit we'll have to turn on this switch uh, we do that for one tick so like that and as you can see this AND gate turned on this AND gate can then be sent to some OR gate somewhere to go to the output of that memory bank so using that AND gate we can read the state of this extra gate but if we wait for one tick longer you can see that we flipped that now we know that we flipped it because we measured that this AND gate gave a one tick pulse. So we are going to be needing to use the same procedure as described before to return on this extra gate. So I'm gonna make a more in-depth video later. Um, but basically this will, this will scale with two gates per bit. Because as you can see, if I scale this to a four by two gate array, you can see that these switches get reused a lot. It's only these two gates that get duplicated all of the time. So it's two gates per bit. This is quite useful for larger memory, but of course the extra circuitry required to do all of the timings is complicated. So it's a bit of a trade-off. For very small amounts of memory, it's probably better to just use extra memory. However, if you need to store hundreds of bytes, you're gonna still end up having about 2000 gates, which is gonna lag out the game. So for that, we have timer memory. Timer memory is quite complicated and I have an entire video series on my YouTube channel explaining how it works. So I'm just gonna refer you to there. But basically the trick of timer memory is that we store the data in this timer. This single timer stores 253 bits of memory in just two blocks. And why is it 253? That's a very long story. I will refer to the YouTube series, just go watch that. So now that we've discussed most types of a resettable memory in Scrap Mechanic, we can start to assemble our tier list. Now, nothing goes into D tier or lower because all logic in Scrap Mechanic is awesome. So everything is C tier or higher. But of course, not every logic is just as awesome as the other. Spotcon memory, it has a place in my heart, but it's just not what you should use nowadays. These spotcons, because they simply in need to interact with the physics engine and need to be moved around, it's just irreliable. So it goes to C tier. Next up, there is this uh, nor nor latch and all of the similar memory that uses three different gates in a loop. Now, it is very useful for beginners to start learning, but for larger logic creations, the limitation of that it needs one tick pulses and that it kind of does weird whenever you put it on a lift, it's just not nice. So it goes into B tier. Next up is timer memory. Now, although timer memory allows for a lot of data storage, there are a few caveats. For example, you need to wait for an amount of time, usually a few seconds, but sometimes a full minute, depending on how your timer memory is set up. The amount of time you need to wait is also basically random and requires complicated timing circuitry. And last but not least, as you can see, there's a lot of overhead circuitry required with a lot of very precise timings. So although you can get a lot of storage, it has some disadvantages. So although it stores a lot of memory, it's not the best of the best. So it goes into A tier. Same goes for this two gates per bit memory. It is awesome that you can store two bits of information in just these four gates. However, the circuitry and timings are just too complicated. So nice that it can store a lot, but it goes to eight here. And last but not least, my personal favorite extra memory is just very clean and not very complicated to explain. And these three gates here are technically a bit not necessary because this can just be a single self-wired gate. It just kind of depends on whether or not you think this is a glitch and shouldn't be used. It goes into the S tier. 
now that we've created this tier list, we need to find a place in the entrance room. That would be fitting, wouldn't it? So, like behind here, I guess? Oh, it's gonna fall over. <laughs> That's kind of put a little thingy, yeah, like that. So I might expand this in later videos, um, but for now that's it. So that's it for this video. Um, I don't really have an outro yet, so uh, subscribe, I guess. Oh, and join the Discord server, of course. Uh, yes, and this is the second time recording this because I totally forgot to press the record button the first time around. <laughs>